And uh, when we talked, you gave me some different stories that I thought the listeners would like to hear. Uh, could you tell me the story about the uh, the Exorcist story? <laughs> uh, when me and all the Sweet Inspirations and their band went to the show that afternoon to yeah. the Exorcist. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, that was hilarious. I will never forget that as long as I live. Uh, a couple of the girls had seen it, but none of the rest of us had. And, you know, it was making a making a whole lot of hoopla. And uh, so we decided to to go see it. So we all left the hotel. And we had a concert that night. So we all got up and went and took a bus called a city bus. I think we were in Baltimore or something like that. And uh, took it to the theater and, and watched it. And... I was raised Catholic, and I, I I did not know what I was in for, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I mean, it just scared the bejesus out of me. But the funniest thing about it was the girls that had seen it uh, were trying to warn us about what was fixing to happen, but the way they were doing it was just unbelievably funny. I mean, they, there weren't many people in the theater at that time of day anyhow. So they were getting very animated. And they were going stuff like, Oh now y'all get ready. She's about to throw up that pea soup looking stuff and just I'm <laughs> going on all that all that kind of thing. I mean, and it just it was absolutely hilarious to be so frightening at the same time. I mean, it had a it had a tremendous effect on me for some reason or another. But I think it was because of my my Catholic roots, my good ass South Louisiana Catholic, where they were very very strict with everything. I can see how it would bother you. And it and it did. It didn't. I'm no prude or anything like that. But it it got me that I didn't expect. Mm-hmm. But thank God, the Sweets and their band uh, were so animated, and were you know. Having fun getting scared, you know, it was just that. Just, uh, but oddly enough, you know, I thought I was okay with it, but when I was taking a shower, I was just remember the uh, when I was taking a shower to go to the show, uh, the uh, shampoo fell off of the soap dish because <laughs> I got my eyes closed washing my head. And uh, fell off the soap dish and hit me on the foot, and I almost had a heart attack. I mean, I swear to God, I came crawling out of that. <laughs> I mean, it just scared the dickens out of me. So, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm, I talked to some people who thought it was the silliest thing they ever saw, but it really got to me. But I'll never forget the way that the that the girls were animating and narrating the whole thing. It was that, that should have been a recording in itself. So. Did you all go out a lot? I mean, like that? No, actually we didn't. Uh, a lot of times we just really didn't have the time to do that. Uh, because by the time we would get to the next city and they would get us bust into the hotels and get our luggage and stuff to us, most of the time we pretty much had to go ahead and get ready. In this particular case, I believe we had, if I remember correctly, we had a couple of shows. So we got to stay over, and we ended up having that time uh, the next day to do something. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of like when we go over to uh, to do these tribute shows in Europe, mm-hmm. uh, like we're going to be doing this coming May as well. Uh, you know, that's no way to see Europe. Well, during, during the road shows, with Elvis is there's no way to to really see the United States because uh, you're either in the plane or in the bus or in the hotel or back in the bus to the Coliseum back in the hotel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so in the morning you get to see a little bit of the sights like you did that afternoon when you were being bussed around. 
but uh, unfortunately, there really wasn't a lot of time because, I mean, the colonel kept us busy. If he had us out there, he had to be making that money, mm-hmm. doing those shows, you know. Now, was there ever a time that you were able to go out, that Elvis was able to go out with you all, or no? Oh, no, I, no that, that never happened. No, that's too bad. Well, it is, but it's the nature of of the cage he had himself in. I mean, honestly, that's, you know, that's where you would hear the stories about him renting the skating rink and, and renting the theaters just so they could go out and, and not be hassled and try to have some sense of normalcy about it. Uh, I, I did not envy him. Mm-hmm. Uh, the way that he was, uh, really, it was almost like a self-imposed exile of some kind or another. He just had to stay isolated. The general public would, wouldn't would let him enjoy himself. He used to go out to some in Vegas in the early days and go to shows. That's where he saw, you know, uh, Tom Jones doing uh, his production uh, for his show that had such a huge impact on him. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's what he decided what he really wanted to do in Vegas. Yeah, hey, uh, there was another story that you told me. Um, Elvis had gifted you a uh, an Omega watch. Yeah, you know he would he would do stuff like that every now and then. That was the only time, besides getting my TCB from him, uh, that was the only time that I was ever uh, fortunate to receive something like that as a gift. But at the time, it's like the first digital watch. And it had a black screen with just little red-orange LEDs. And it wouldn't tell the time unless you mashed a button on the side of it. (laughs) And you could only see it at nighttime. That was the funny part. So... Everybody in the show had one. Everybody in the bands, all the bands and, you know, all of his Memphis Mafia. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> everybody, you know, everybody, of course, was wearing them because it was fun to wear, and they were big and bulky. And uh, But if, if you ever saw anybody outside or in the bright sunlight, uh, they wanted to see the tiny <laughs> hand over it like that and uh, it kind of puts your eye down on it so you could read it in the dark. Mm. It wasn't particularly practical. Do you still have it? Watch. Well, actually, no. I I gave it uh, to my older brother at one point because, I mean, I, I don't like jewelry. I don't really wear jewelry anyway. Uh, and that watch was just was so big. It was fun to wear at first because, you know, I always gave it to you. Sure. But years years later, uh, didn't make a whole lot of sense, and uh, it was still working. So I gave it to my brother, mm-hmm. and he tried to wear it for a while and experienced the same things that I did about it. And uh, so there was a a guy that contacted me years ago, and uh, he was a, a fan. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm trying to remember where he was from. And I think he got my address from from Ronnie Tutt. He's from North Carolina. Uh, His name was Randy Erdman. And Randy is just one of those people that you just know is totally sincere, uh, completely enjoys. Uh, his association with uh, the world of Elvis uh, and the people that are in it. And he was so consistent with his communications and birthdays and Christmas and and all of that. Just uh, one Christmas, I just boxed that thing up and sent it to him. So it is, uh, I don't even know if it's, I suppose it could still run if you could get the right battery for it, but you know. But uh, at the time, I didn't know what else to do with it, and mm-hmm. uh, nobody in my family, you know, cared anything about having it. Of course, my oldest son, who is our archivist, 
he'd uh, he'd steal it <laughs> if he had a chance to. He'd love to have it. But uh, it, I, I was very happy to give that to Randy, uh-huh. and I hope it has brought him joy over the years. Now, Duke, how old were you when you first started to work with Elvis? Uh, I think I pretty much had just turned thirty. Yeah. Now, how how was it going on stage for the first time with uh, hired guns like uh, James Burton and Glendy Harden and uh, Ronnie Tut? How was it? I mean, you, you know, Joe. I tell you, man. It. You know, I never felt uh, anywhere near as qualified as as they most definitely are and were. Uh, but I just had to trust in Providence that uh, Ronnie's judgment was correct and I should be able to do the gig. Mm-hmm. And and I was there. You know, I, I had it. And, you know, it was up to me to do whatever I could to play it professionally and, and hold on to it if it was uh, in the course for me to do that. Uh, but, it, you know, to me it was a thrill because I was aware of, of those guys already going into this, and uh, particularly James Burton and Glenn Hart, and uh, so that was a that was a real treat. It really was, and I, I enjoyed. You know, you don't hear John Wilkinson's name mentioned uh, all that often uh, these days, but John was the nicest guy. I had more fun with him, uh, and he just. He, his the example that he said is the quiet professional. You know, I should have paid more attention to him. I think. Now, <laughs> you, your first show at Vegas, I think we found it was January twenty sixth, nineteen seventy four. Can you tell us about what happened at the first show? You told me a story about some buzzing. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember exactly what the date was. I thought it was earlier in January than that, but maybe it's just because, you know. I knew it was coming, and I was nervous about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, I, you know, the rehearsals had gone well. I felt uh, confident that I knew the show. And <laughs> it was like, this is it, man. This is my man. This is, I mean, because I'm an Elvis nut. I was all about Elvis. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I could not, just could not believe that I was having the opportunity to do that. And... Uh, I was getting telegrams from my family back in Baton Rouge and, you know, all kinds of encouragement and everything. And they were more nervous than I was. And I was nervous. And we got on stage. We went through the opening theme, bucks it on down into the first song. And, uh, boy, he was looking good. He was frisky. He'd been on a diet, man. He was slim and trim and mean. And uh, we got through that whole opening. And uh, when he, you know, when he finished that song, was about to go into another one, we heard an audible buzz and obviously a grounding noise. And it was unfortunate because it was loud. And uh, he he said something. He said, y'all need to take care of that and do it now, please. And uh, we started the next song off and, of course, while it was going on, you couldn't hear it. Uh, and when the song was over, it was still there. And, he's, you know, he made some other comment about it. And, uh, I had an old instrument. That was in 74. And the instrument I had was a 61 Fender Precision Bass uh, that I had been using in the studios uh, for a long time and and performing with it and never had a moment's trouble with it, but it had never, ever been exposed to that kind of almost radiation Mm -hmm. (laughs) as you get from all of those theater lights and all the big rheostats that control. And, um, I did never in my mind. I was the problem. And it was in between the song. Again, we could hear it. And subconsciously, I just rolled my off, and it went away. And I'm going, this this could not be happening. This this you know this could not be me making that noise. 
and you know he he was he made some kind of gesture like thank you, you know thank you Jesus, and uh, he was turning around to put his cup down, and I, I rolled the volume back up very discreetly, I thought, and started hearing it again, and he saw me roll it off, and the sound stopped. So I was busted. <laughs> And the whole rest of the show, I had to monitor my volume knob and uh, turn it up down if necessary. It was a nightmare for me. I mean, my whole concept of who I was, where I was, and what I was doing went out the window. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the new guy on stage, and I was screwing the show. So that was not fun. No. It really wasn't. And uh, so I found out what the best music store uh, in Vegas was at the time, and I was there first thing in the morning. We worked on it and worked on it and thought we had it and went back, and we didn't have it. It wasn't bad, but it was still there. So he was, he was really losing patience with me at that point. So I had to let the guys keep it at the at the shop and try some other things. We ended up having to replace the pickups, and it, so I didn't have those old vintage pickups anymore, but that's what did it. Mm-hmm. Once, we, once we put uh, up-to-date pickups in it, it, it finished it. But uh, I will not soon forget that moment of realization. Now, well, you got... I <laughs> you got... Rid I realized of... that he realized that the I mean, was me. Good Lord have mercy. Yeah, Duke, are you on a uh, uh, portable phone? I'm on my phone. Yeah, oh, it's cutting in and out. Oh, really? Yeah, it's oh, cutting out. Oh, man, I'm sorry. It's cutting in and out. Is that messing up what we're doing? Yeah, it's cutting in and out real bad. Halfway through the story, it got real bad. What am I doing? Well, I want to step outside here and see if that'll help. Give us okay. A clean or I start over? You need to call me back and all that? No, no, no. I'll just go right into it. Uh... Now, you got rid of the Omega watch, and I was wondering about your costumes. How did you get your costumes? I mean, and do you still have them? No, I don't. And the the funny part about it is that when Emory joined the band, uh, they had new clothes made. And Emory is a formidable uh, musician and man as he is. Is it's not particularly large, and part of the deal was I had somehow or another I had to fit into Emery's clothes, and unfortunately the the little lady that made all the uniforms had just recently passed away, and they didn't feel like it was possible to get them duplicated, so they sent them to the seamstress and let all of the tops and pants out in all directions as much as they possibly could. Mm-hmm. And I lost 15 pounds, I think, going into it and fit into them. Uh, rather snugly, I might add. Uh, I wasn't really comfortable with that, uh, having those, those farm-fitted... Uh, I forget what the material was like, but it was like some kind of polyester. Unfortunately, it stretched a little bit. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, no, actually, when I left the show, uh, I got a, a message from Emory that since he had actually paid for them, I think, or something like that, that he would like to have them back. And I brought them to him. No, there was only one he wanted. He wanted the black one with the rhinestones, if I remember correctly. But, no, I didn't. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't end up in the other Um Duke, was there ever a time that you were able to sit down and have a one-on-one with Elvis? That happened a couple of times, Joe, uh, but really not not very often because he was always around so many people. Mm -hmm. And one night, uh, Donnie Sumner and I were last ones left up in the penthouse and he hadn't been out at all, so we were just visiting. And he just came out of the bedroom and uh, sat down on the couch with us 
and we must we visited till the sun came up, and that was really enjoyable uh, to be talking to him and not have uh, you know all that activity around, and uh, got got to some really good discussions, uh, uh, mostly about spirituality. Uh-huh. So that was really enjoyable. And one other time, uh, I had gotten off into one of the books up there or something, and I realized I was by myself, so I started tiptoeing out of there. And I went by the door to their suite. Uh, he was with Linda Thompson then. And uh, I went by the door, and they were in the, they were in the bedroom, in the pajamas. And he said, come on in here. <laughs> I'm you know, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to just vanish. <laughs> but I went I went on in there and they were just as relaxed and fun. Uh Linda had on some some Union Jack footy pajamas. I thought I was just amazed at that. I thought she'd be in some kind of robe of the Queens or something like that. But she, that was one thing I really liked about that girl. She was she was very down to earth. Uh and Elvis had him some old silk jammies on. <laughs> they had rolled him up there a a uh, rolling busing tray with uh, a bus tub full of cut up watermelons. And he was sitting there in the chair. Linda was up on the bed, and I was sitting on the edge of the bed, and talking to them, and visiting them with him, and watching him just eat up. That watermelon, my God, that boy could put some watermelon away. <laughs> and uh, so that's that's the most personal. Those two times were the most personal exchanges that I had had with them. Uh, and we're grateful for that mm-hmm. because, you know, as nervous as I was, uh, they made me uh, as comfortable as I could be, which was Okay, comfortable, but not, but not totally. I wasn't gonna get there and you know stretch out on the bed and anything like that. I was looking for my opportunity to not disturb them anymore. But uh, hmm. that's that's those two stories, that Joe. Now, uh, the today uh, LP sessions when you were in the studio doing that with Elvis and that, uh, how, how was Elvis? How was his mood in that? How was everybody else's mood? Do you remember it well? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, there was there was more tension in that one than some of the other times that we were in the studio for some reason or another, and I'm not real sure why. I pretty much figured that I was, you know probably officially on my way out. So I was more relaxed, actually, than I normally was in the studio and uh, was able to play some of the best bass, I thought, Uh the whole time that I was with him. And that's how I got on that uh, as the bass player on T-R-O-U-B-L-E because they liked that song so much. They went ahead and... Uh, released that as a single while the rest of the album was being completed, and I, I didn't, I didn't think that he was having as as much fun as he normally would, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, he was a little bit more critical. Uh, with you or with everybody? No, pretty much, you know, in general. Yeah, he, yeah, he snapped at me a couple of times. Uh-huh. You know, maybe I wasn't learning the song quick enough or something or another. Uh-huh. Uh, did you think that's why they uh, removed your bass? Or? Well, you know, I never knew for sure why they did that. Uh-huh. But I obviously was, was not going to be with the show anymore. Mm-hmm. And I just didn't think that they felt like giving me credit you know, for being the bass player on. And, uh, you know, of course, I went through that whole thing about, well, damn, maybe uh, maybe what I was playing wasn't good enough. Uh-huh. And then somehow or another, I don't know 
who found it or who got a hold to it, but uh, somebody got the masters to that session before they took me off. And I actually got to hear it. And uh, there wasn't nothing wrong with what I was playing. No. It was just a thing. I was, I was done. Well, you know, get me out of there. Uh-huh. That had to be awfully hard to do because, I mean, they they do it differently now. I mean, um, you don't go in and lay each track down separately. You were all in one room, weren't you? Oh, yeah, we were playing it. We were playing, but the thing is, is that even though we were all in the same room, they had as much isolation on each thing as they could get. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in that particular case, you know, I was just uh, running uh, into a what they call a DI box, and out of the box, my signal was taken directly into the control room, so they could do anything they wanted to with it. They could mm-hmm. change EQ or, you know, whatever. <laughs> and they could take it off too, <laughs> which they did. A, I mean, that's what they do. You know, it's a funny thing about all this, Joe, is that, that you know I'm a singer, songwriter, guitar player, and I just happen to you know play bass as well. I, I never have, and still do not to this day consider myself a bass player. You know, uh-huh. still it's a singer songwriter. And I, I enjoy the bass, don't get me wrong. I really do. In fact, I love it. But it's, uh, I'm just glad to be still playing, man. Yeah. Hey, Duke, is there a story that you could share with the listeners that uh, you just think would be a cool story? I mean, this is your interview. I want to be able to get other stories out of you. And Is there anything that you've always wanted to share with people uh, about Elvis or about uh being on the the plane with the other uh, band members, uh, any other stories that you could share with us? Well, it's a hard one, huh? <laughs> well, it, it is, Joe, because the the things that that mattered the most to me was that I was considered for the job in the first place, uh-huh. and and that I was accepted into the organization uh, on a trial basis. I went through all the rehearsals. I did the first long stretch at Vegas, and then I did that first really long tour, ending up in Memphis, recording the Live in Memphis album. Uh And that was the night that, you know, that I got my TCB that I was actually put it on, put it on around my neck and hooked it. Mm -hmm. And that was a very, very special moment for me probably the most special. I had been officially accepted into the group. And, uh, you know, I had already gotten somewhat comfortable uh, with the people on the show. Uh, but, then, you know, the, it, it really got <laughs> the things that I liked so much about it was just the personalities of the individuals. And in the back of that uh, Lockheed Lodestar that we used, uh, was a round lounge, mm-hmm. and uh, with uh, you know nice comfortable passenger seats with seat belts on them. And back there would be uh, J.D. Sumner and uh, you know one or two of his boys, maybe Glenn B. Harden. Uh, those that were more inclined to kind of party would go back there and I, I I'd love to go back there because they just constantly entertaining uh with stories and 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 stuff and you know most everybody else that had any good sense had already got their little pillow out and trying to sleep before the next show. <laughs> but uh my my companionship with those people that were in that show uh was very, very special to me. I loved them dearly. I really did. And I, you know, towards the end of it, you know, I, I couldn't help but feel like I, you know, had let them down. Uh-huh. Uh, but I got to be honest with you, man. You know, when Jerry decided he wanted to come back and play again, uh, that was his spot. You yeah. know, I was just holding that spot down for him as far as I was concerned. I, you know, I never it never entered my mind. I, I was with it longer than I thought I was going to be. Mm-hmm. Honestly, but uh, 
as, as far as a particular moment, I think him putting that TCB around my neck, and he and he and Linda, and there wasn't anybody in the room but us, and uh, that will always stand out as a, a very proud moment for me. Mm-hmm. Do you, Do you still have your uh, TCB? No, I don't. Uh, I gave it to Tut my last night. Uh, Ronnie had given his to uh, Gerald, the Sweets' bass player, who was no longer with the show. And uh, because Gerald, who had one, uh, lost his playing touch football. Mm-hmm. And Ronnie just gave him his, just knowing that they would, you know, you, know, you take this, Gerald, you know, I'll get another one. And when he asked for another one, they said, yeah, you can have, you know, 2300 bucks, or something like that. And I was just floored that they would not give Ronnie another one of those TCB and necklaces when they gave him to the bellhops and the doorman and, you know, they, just, they would just pass him out uh-huh. and would not give Ronnie that necklace. And so the last show, obviously I was out, and uh, I just I took it off and just gave it to him. And I said, "Look, I've, I've tried fraternities before. I never was any good with them, but I'm sure that you can see that, you know, on top of everything else that I had to, you know, endure." which a lot of it wasn't doing. But, you know, people always ask about that stuff, too. You know, but the thing was, man, that was some serious fun. I mean, (laughs) it was stressful Uh uh, to be playing on that show and to do that and to have that responsibility. But that's about more fun than I've ever had in my life. You know. Take a lot out of you? Yeah. Oh, it did. Yeah, when when I'd get back home... uh, it, it would it would take me a while to recuperate, and then see when I get back home. Then then I'd have to go. Uh, for the last year or so, I was playing with a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Gene Clark. Uh, Gene Clark was uh, Mr. Tambourine Man in The Birds. Uh-huh. He was a singer songwriter that was in The Birds, and a buddy of mine and I uh, were playing with him. So I'd get home from Elvis and the and the limos and the and you know and all of that in the in the private airplanes and all that kind of stuff and get an old Dodge van with Gene and we'd hit the road. And uh he was just an amazing songwriter so and I'd still play bass with him but then when we get back to that then I'd put the other hat on and I would go out uh to uh, to the open mics and the coffee houses and stuff and get out there and just start singing my songs, just doing the old troubadour thing. So I was really blessed to have a a wide variety of musical experiences out there, but that time with EP was uh, was pretty much on the top of the list, Bubba. Well, when you knew that it was at the end, were you at least able to thank Elvis and say goodbye, or it was none of that? None of that. No. No, it was none of that. Um. we just had that little water gun fight on the last show. That oh. uh, I got some satisfaction out of that. Oh. Well, I cheated. <laughs> oh, you got to tell me about it, please. Oh, man, I cheated big time. Well, they had a guy from, I was working with Fender Music Company, uh, field testing some bass equipment for him. And, uh, one of the guys um, from the company was sitting right at the foot of the stage first chair at a table and uh, when Ellis came by he handed them a water gun and I was looking at him and I knew him and I was like looking at him and I said you must be crazy to do something like that because I knew that you know he knew I was going he knew Jerry was coming back you know he didn't care nothing about sparing my feelings Uh, and sure enough you know when it was time to introduce the man well, as he was introducing everybody, he'd squirt them. Uh-huh. You know, act like he was going to and make them duck and, you know, all that kind of foolishness. 
Man, I was looking at that boy from Fender, and I was just scowling at him going, you don't know what you've done. You know, because I knew what I was fixing to get. And uh, he, he reaches up, 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 come in his hand, came up from the edge of the stage, and it was holding a bigger gun than Elvis had. Uh-huh. And, he, and he mouthed the words, he said, you want it? And I'm going, of course I want it. But now Elvis was working his way down around. So what he did was slide the gun across the stage when Elvis was looking the other way, and Kathy West Marlin got it. By then, everybody knows that I'm fixing to really get it. I mean, they just know. It's it's Mm -hmm. my time to get it. It's my last show. And uh, so when he turns around to face the audience, she takes that gun and she just tosses it through the air. And it's like it was in slow motion. It, 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 you know, all those stage lights and stuff, and it was just flipping through the air. And I'm playing, and I just held my hand out, and it landed right in my hand. So I quickly stuck it in my waistband of my pants in the back and kept right on playing. <laughs> when it came down, because he was squirting everybody, when it came down uh, to me, he's going, now, this guy, and as soon as he said that, I reached behind me and pulled my gun out. And he's going, oh, that's the way it's going to be, huh? I'm going, yep, kind of looks like it. I squirted it a couple times to make sure it was squirt. He said, all right. So he put his gun down by his side. I put mine down by his side. Oh, he's holding the microphone. <laughs> he's holding his microphone, and he goes, one, Two, and as soon as she said two, I came up with that gun, and I just started squirting him, got him all up in the face, got him, I mean, just like, just wet him up, just got him, cheated, but I got him, mm. and he tried to, he tried to turn around and duck his head and shoot backwards, and I had a spring coil base cord on my base that, uh, you know, it looked like it was only six feet long, but it stretched out to about 25 feet. <laughs> Man, I chased him. I was squirting him all on his butt and all that. <laughs> I got the, that's, that's a, a childish, I mean, a very childish, but effective uh, departure. <laughs> was he a good sport about it? Yeah, he kind of laughed. He just, you know, he just, you know, he was PO'd because I cheated. You know? Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> that's what was so funny. You yeah. know, I mean, he was he was going to get me. I mean, he was going to really get me. And the only way, I mean, the reason I won was because I cheated. But I, yeah. I got him. Was there it a, was after that, that. I'm sorry, Joe, go ahead. Uh, was there a lot of uh, fooling around on stage? I mean, because you must have, it must be. The boredom must really get to you. I mean, show after show, the same thing every time. Uh, he he get bored real quick, and uh, and and that's why you had to watch him so close, because he would do anything that would come to his mind if it would amuse him. Uh-huh. And unfortunately, a lot of the humor within that organization was at someone else's expense, usually. But. Uh, you know, he liked taking a glass of water and sip out of it, and this was kind of a thing between him and uh, Glenn D. Harden that he'd throw that glass of water at Glenn D. Of course, Glenn D.'s behind the grand piano, and he could see it coming, and he would just duck down on the piano seat as it sailed over his head, <laughs> and he'd sit back up. That was like a little game they had going. Uh, and he'd, he'd fool with people. He really would, but... Uh, Poor Charlie, I felt sorry for Charlie all the time because uh, Elvis would use him to demonstrate some karate moves and stuff like that. And just like, you know, some of that stuff bound to hurt. Mm-hmm. But oh. the boredom is, is exactly right. I mean, you nailed it. Particularly in Vegas when we would do two shows mm-hmm. in a night. Oh, man. That was hard on him. I mean, everybody else we're doing, we get paid for. But for him to maintain his attitude and spontaneity and everything else was really hard for him. Yeah, it had to get it had to get hard. Um, is there anything else that you want to share with the listeners, Duke? 
Well, uh, I'm going to be coming back over to Europe in the first part of May with uh, uh, this color, original Elvis tribute tour. And this will be the third one that we've done. Uh, it's the promoter's Arjun Delane. And we have um, Sue Marino, who is well-known in Europe. Uh, we have uh, Mark Sanger, fine, fine drummer. Uh, Chris Casello from Nashville is the uh, lead guitar player, and he's uh, he is a fireball. Uh, I'll be playing bass. We are very lucky, and I look forward to, for the first time, having uh, Bobby Woods on keyboards. And Bobby Woods was with all the very successful sessions that Elvis did at American Studios with In the Ghetto and Suspicious Minds and those tunes. Uh, Johnny Christopher is going to be playing rhythm guitar. And Johnny uh, was another fine session player, and he wrote You're Always on My Mind and a couple of other songs that Elvis did. And the band is fronted by Robert Washington. Uh, his first time that he came to Europe with us was uh, just this past year on the uh, 2010 tour. And he is a fireball himself, too. Uh, that boy was so much fun to work with, and he just loves him some Elvis Presley. And he's a, uh, he won the Elvis trivia contest so many times in Memphis, they won't even let him enter it anymore. I mean, so he's a serious student, and he's a fine, fine singer and a great, entertaining performer. So I'm looking forward to coming back. And uh, we're just now starting to get the dates in. Oh, cool. uh, we're gonna, we'll be in the Netherlands again, Finland, uh, Spain, Italy, mm -hmm. uh, Norway, Sweden. Uh, right back to touring and, again. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm just looking forward to coming back because it's so much fun. And with the addition of Bobby Wood and Johnny Christopher on this show, uh, that's going to be a whole lot of fun for everybody. Will, so, you still, uh, will you be using the same bass that you used when you played with Elvis? No, I don't travel with that one. I don't take it out. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a Fender Jazz bass that I have hot rodded to the way that I like it, and uh, I'll be using that. But uh, my old bass, his name is Chief, and uh, <laughs> I take Chief out every now and then, but uh, that's that's some hard work, and, and I really wouldn't want to lose it in, yeah. in some luggage mishap or something like that or get it stolen or something. Yeah, so, no, that would be awful. Well, that was... Uh, uh, that was a good question, though, Joe. <laughs> I have I have taken and done some shows with it and stuff like that, and it's uh, very sentimental to me, as yeah. you can well imagine. I would hate to see anything happen to it. Well, Duke, and it's fun visiting with you. It really is, and I uh, and I hope uh, you and Lee get some use out of this and enjoy it. It's, I, it's fun for me to relive a lot of those stories. Maybe not all of them, but. Uh, <laughs> I really, I really do enjoy it, and I still, I love me some Elvis Presley. I mean, I, you know, be the whipping boy for a while, but I, it never affected the fact that, you know, he made a difference in my life uh -huh. as a young, young teenager, and and always, and and that I got to play with him is, uh, I'm still asking the good Lord, what was that all about? 182 concerts. Yeah, something like that. Somebody counted them. I'm glad they did. I'm curious. Yeah. Well, thank you, well, Duke. You take care of yourself, man. All right. And uh, you call anytime. It's always good to talk to you and tell Lehigh for me. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, buddy. Bye-bye.